with that last question. How can we go through and make that product? Right. And we'll add a caveat to this, starting with benzene. All right, so somehow or another, we need to add or do our substitution reactions, starting with benzene, to make that final product. How many steps minimally do we need to do? Why three? There are three groups attached to the benzene ring. So minimally, we need to do three steps. It is also a reasonable number, right? Okay. So what I would go through and do personally is list out what reagents I would need to do to put on each of those pieces. Okay. And then we'll worry later about the other parts. So which of those three groups do you know how to put on? Okay. Start with the bromine. I am trying to color code this. What reagents do you need to add to get bromine? BR2 and FeBr3. Okay. Just because you started with FeBr3, I want you to be aware. FeBr3 may not be there. Okay. The iron tribromine is a catalyst to help facilitate the reaction. So don't be assuming that you have to have it. Okay. If you think back to the lab we did Monday, we didn't have iron tribromide, and yet we were still able, able to brominate. Okay, so BR2 is what you should be looking for, not the FeBr3. Okay. But if we don't have FeBr3, will the reaction happen? Yes, that's what I just said. It absolutely will happen, which is why you need to trigger on the bromine, BR2, uh -huh. not the iron tribromide. Will we count it off for that on the test, though? In a show your work, no. Uh, in a multiple choice, mm -hmm. you probably won't see the option of just bromine or bromine and FeBr2 or 3. Okay. What's the next one you know how to put on? Uh, HNO3. Okay. We're hearing a volunteer for the nitro group. The nitro group is coming from HNO3. Is that it? HNO3 will not do this reaction on its own. We need the sulfuric acid to facilitate this reaction. Okay, both need to be present. Those two will generate the nitronium ion. The nitronium ion is what we can then add to the, or substitute on our ring. Last thing, how do we put the last thing on there? It's an acylation reaction. Okay. If we wanted to try and maintain the geometry so it looks exactly the same. Minimally, we need to I draw it roughly the same. That piece, right? What charge would that carbon need to be? That blue carbon? It needs to be what charge for a EAS reaction? It needs to be positive. We don't add anything starting in a charged state. Almost everything we work with has to be neutral. Mm -hmm. So we need to attach something to that carbon to temporarily stabilize it and maintain the positive character. What would we put there? We can drop in a halogen. All right. This might work on its own, but we really typically add a catalyst with this. That catalyst Aluminum trichloride. All right, the aluminum trichloride helps to pull that chlorine off and generate our electrophile so we can run our reaction. So those are our three reagents. So now the question is, does it matter the order in which we put them on? Yes. Yes. Right, it will absolutely be important okay, for multiple reasons. Okay, what if I put the nitro group on first? That would be a good option. Okay, why? Go ahead. So the nitro, if we put that on first, will direct to the meta positions. Okay. As a meta director, that's not going to work for us. Okay. Our purple group, our acyl group, is meta to the nitro, but the bromine is not. 
So if I put on the nitro first, I'm now shut down. Okay, I wouldn't be able to get the bromine on in the right position. There's another reason why we might want to avoid putting the nitro group on first. It's electron withdrawing, which means what happens to the rate of the reaction. It deactivates the ring. Right? So if we put the nitro group on, we've now nullified the reactivity of the ring. It's going to take even longer to go through and do each of the subsequent steps. Okay? So that's not a particularly good thing to do. So we can look at it, because everybody called the director first. We'll do meta and then deactivating, M slash D. What would the bromine do? Okay, bromine is classified as a halogen. What do halogens do? They are deactivators. They do take away electrons. That's why it's deactivating. Where do they direct? They're paraortho. They're one of those weird ones. Okay. So we put the bromine on our ring is deactivated, which kind of sucks. It's going to slow down our reactions. Mm -hmm. And we have a paraortho directing. Does paraortho work out for us? Where are the groups relative to the bromine? One's para, and the other one is ortho. Hey, that looks actually pretty solid. That starts to match. Okay, so let's go ahead and take as a first guess that our first step is going to be the bromination. All right, let's again try and maintain the orientation. Okay. What about our last reaction, the acyl group? Yes. The bromine deactivates. It slows the rate of the reaction. So that is bad. Okay? But we do have this paraortho situation. Okay, so, so it's like lesser of two evils? Lesser of two evils as far as the deactivating goes. But the meta directing completely nullified our ability. Right, right. So the nitro's out entirely is the first option because we cannot get our reaction to work appropriately if we put on the nitro. The bromine does deactivate, but at least it gets us our proper positions. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. And I really should have asked about purple before we said red was the first one, but we can come back to that in a second. Yes? Can you explain again why we FeBr3? FeBr3 is the catalyst. So what the FeBr3 will do, because the iron is partially positive, will suck electrons from one of the bromines. Well, if that one electron loses, or that one bromine loses electrons, what happens to the other bromine? It loses even more electrons, and we end up with a positive bromine. What we're trying to find in the EAS reaction is our E, which is the electrophile, which means it has to be positive. So the FeBr3 is a Lewis acid catalyst. It draws the electron density away from our bromine so that we make a positive bromine. Without the FeBr3, our bromine is neutral. We're looking at a relatively low concentration of the electrophile because that bond does not polarize easily. Okay. So it's solely there as a catalyst. How, does, uh, how do you do an like, orthoperator right now, though, when there's nothing to compare it to? Well, let's just erase that. So deciding ortho or para. You're right. We have nothing to compare to from our starting material. But if we look at our product, so if we put the bromine on first, what positions do I need to put on the next two? Where are they relative to the bromine? Para and ortho. Okay. If we looked at the nitro, if we put the nitro on first, it directs only to the meta positions. Where are our groups, our other groups, in comparison to the nitro? ortho and meta. So the meta could work, but the ortho does not. If I put the nitro on first, there is no way to put the bromine on. Does that make sense? The bromine wouldn't go on at that position. We might be able to force it with time, the whole deactivating issue, but it still goes to the meta position. We still can't put it in the ortho. 
So what we're doing is thinking about what happens once I put them on, where do they direct? Hi. Purple one. What happens when I put that guy on? Where does it direct? Or activate, deactivate? Hi. We look at, to determine this, atom X. Atom X is the one immediately attached to the ring, which is what atom? Carbon. 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 Is that carbon charged? Partially. I like the partially. Where are you going with partially? Why do you say partially? Because it's attached to the chlorine. The chlorine Not when it's attached to the ring. So we're assuming now that we've got it on the ring, we're looking at atom X. The oxygen draws electron density away just based on electronegativity effect, but even worse, thank you, we have a resonance effect that makes that carbon positive, which is less electrons than a hydrogen. If atom X has less electrons than hydrogen, it directs to the meta position. Is it activator or deactivator? Deactivator. Deactivator. So now we've got a pseudo dilemma that we addressed with the nitro. If it deactivates, it slows all of our reactions. But all of the pieces we're putting on here slow the reaction. So do we care about deactivating? No, at least not initially. If we put on our acyl group first, it only directs to the meta positions. Where are the groups, the other two groups, relative to our acyl group? Meta and para. Meta and para. So if I put the acyl group on, I can't put the bromine on. Okay? So the acyl group doesn't work first. The nitro group doesn't work first. That means put the bromine on first. Okay? So if we drop our bromine on first with our Br2 and our iron tribromide catalyst, Now what do we do? Right, we got an interesting conundrum here. We could run with the nitro group first. I do see your hand. Just give me a sec. Just want to address what everybody had already said. Or with our acyl group. And then, by natural segue, that would then leave the next piece to go on at the last step, right? So those are now our two options. And I know everybody loves writing things out, so what you're all doing right now is writing out both of these two options, right? So that you can then evaluate and look at them and decide which is best, right? Right. Yeah. So I thought. Simone? So you're putting the bromine on first because both of those are meta? We're putting on the bromine first because what we're doing is looking at what would happen with our products. Where are the next two things going to go relative to the bromine? Where do they go? So we're assuming our bromine here, oops, let's color that in red, is right here. Where is the ortho position relative to the bromine? It's where the nitro group is and that carbon is. Those are ortho to the bromine. So where I think you might be getting confused is that when we looked at a ring, what I drew up was some structure like in the upper right hand, left, left hand corner. And I said this was your ortho position. This was your meta. This was your para. And what I think a lot of students do is they go, OK, the ortho is always the upper right hand corner. No. The ortho is always one carbon away from my group. It's always with reference to that X group. In the case of where our bromine is, our X is now on the side. So our ortho position, one carbon away. There's our ortho. So our nitro is added to the ortho position. Okay? That matches where the directing ability of the bromine. Where does the acyl group go? Para also matches the directing effects of the bromine. If we went through and put on the nitro group, the nitro group directs where? Meta. The meta positions only. 
what are at the meta positions. The acyl group, so putting on the nitro does allow me to get up the acyl group on, but can I possibly get the bromine to the ortho position to the nitro group? No. Not going to work cleanly. In the blue on the bottom, is there supposed to be HNO3? You're right. All right. Go ahead, Isaac, unless you need eye contact. Uh, not entirely. <laughs> Instead of writing this all out, I'll do that. I know. It's understandable. Yes and no. So here's the reasoning behind this. Yes, what you just described is perfectly valid, and that's where I want you to get. The issue that I am seeing is that people are trying to jump to the answer without understanding what they're looking at. If you don't, or if you're immediately trying to jump to the answer, 90% of the time you will get it wrong. Okay? So good job. You got it right. I'm not, I'm not trying to, to rip on you for that. Okay? But if you are getting confused, you absolutely must write it down. Okay? And then as a secondary note, I would almost say stop working with Isaac. <laughs> because he's able to skip those steps. You're not at the point where you can skip those steps. So you need to be working with people that are showing those steps so you can get through that work. Okay? And I'm not ripping on Isaac necessarily. It's just you have to make sure that you're working with people that are showing you what's happening. Okay? And Isaac, you did a, a very good job. You saw exactly what the next topic is going to be. Which of these two is going to be the best option? Okay? In both cases, we would end up with the final product. Both of these answers are valid. Okay? But in a multiple choice exam, there's only one answer. So one of these is more valid than the other. Why is one more valid than the other? It's going to come down to speed. Which of these is going to go faster? The nitro group is the most deactivating functional group that we've got, second most. Okay. With it being so deactivating, as soon as it's now attached to the ring, what happens to the speed of our reaction? Goes virtually to slow, to slow, to zero means we don't get the reaction to occur, and we have to sit in lab for 24 hours waiting for our reaction to finish. Okay? We don't want to do that. So what we do is look at it and say, if I put on the acyl group first, the acyl group is a deactivator, okay? but it won't slow down the reaction quite as badly as the nitro, which then means I can put the nitro on a little bit easier. Okay? Is there another reason behind it? Bromine directs where? Para-ortho. Para if we put the nitro on first, where would I expect the nitro, nitro to go? Para-position. Para where do I want it? Ortho. Ortho. So it makes sense to block that para-position so it can't put the nitro there. So it also makes sense to put the acyl group on first. Well, that's where I was going. That's where my mind Both answers work. Okay. Which one is dominant? Like once the, never mind. Once the para position is blocked, it doesn't matter. It can't go to the para position anymore. Because remember, in EAS, what are we substituting? An electrophile or a hydrogen for an electrophile. So there has to be a hydrogen on the ring. Okay. For an EAS reaction to work. If we remove all of the hydrogens, there's no EAS. Okay. Why is that even further tricky? How many hydrogens are drawn on any of those structures? None. They're all implied. You have to remember that. Okay. Get the general process. Let's first settle with that. I know, it's a big mess of work, which is exactly what your homework should look like.
I don't understand. Would we get a second pro would we get a product? Yeah, we'd get another product. I didn't draw that product here. But if you make this step, is that the other one? Okay, we get more points or Absolutely. That's what I just said. The one in black gets you points. Anything else is wrong. Well, you'd get partial credit, but that's it. Yes, why? It's slower, which by definition means it's less valid. That's how organic works. So you count on the speed to. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Hypothetically, if they were both meta, where would like which one would outrank it for the third step? How do you know like which one would direct that third one to go? What's our rule if we've got two competing positions for our substitution? And since I think I've got the full slides here. Oh, maybe I don't have the full slides. Oh. If we have competing, what's our rule? Activator trumps. Strongest activator trumps. Always, always, always. Activator trumps deactivator. The next rule says activator trumps weaker activator, which means the strongest the activator, that's the one that wins. That's what controls where our positions, where our substitutions occur. Okay? And if we have two things on there, okay, and they both direct to one position but then split their differences other ways, they'll both go to that one position. Is that another question? Yep. So it's the least. Exactly right. So it's a full on spectrum. The one that's highest on your activation to deactivation pole wins. Right? Yes, and that does kind of suck. You do have to have some familiarity with each of those pieces, but you don't have to have the whole thing memorized. The ones that you should memorize? The ones that you know how to put on. <laughs> Those are the ones you should memorize. All the other ones that you don't know how to put on, don't worry about memorizing those because you can't put them on. Uh oh. Hopefully, not to my writing because you're not getting that. I don't want I said it's the second strongest deactivator of all our deactivators. Of all our deactivators. Oh, Some yeah. total. Take a look in your textbook. There's one deactivator that's worse. It's a quaternary nitrogen. So a nitrogen with four things attached to it. Still has a positive charge. This nitro group still has a positive charge, but at least has resonance to pseudo-stabilize that nitrogen. I would make that argument as well. Look at the directing effects before you look at activating, deactivating. Yep. Yes. So there's two possibilities that go on with that. If we go through and put on our nitro first. Where does it direct to? Where does the bromine direct? Ortho and para. Okay, I've been telling you that you should memorize para before ortho. So our primary product is that. We also end up with the ortho in a much smaller yield. Okay. You still have them present. So what we would probably see is maybe something like 70% and 30%. Which doesn't give you your final product in any great quantity. In any great quantity. So there's a second reason we don't want to do the nitro. Not only does it slow it down, but what happens to our yield? Way it also falls through the floor. We can still get there. It is still possible. We just have all these things counting against it, making that the least op best option. So if you have a choice between two horrible choices, 
You pick the best of those horrible choices. <laughs> okay. That's why you're all in OCHEM 2. And hopefully that's why you're with me. Okay. Question. Because at this point, we are now done with EAS. Okay. And to me, EAS makes sense. The rest of it, I think, kind of goes out the window. Okay. This one's actually not too bad. Benzylic carbons. Okay. So we've seen allylic carbons. Oops. I drew the allylic carbon wrong. What's wrong with the allylic carbon that I drew? Yeah, it's missing a hydrogen. I can't imply it because I have the other hydrogen specified. So I was just straight up wrong. Okay. But now it's drawn on, so you can't even tell. The allylic position is one carbon away from a double bond. Okay. That is your allylic position. We had some very particular chemistry that happened at that position uh, when we looked at substitution reactions. And that was because we can do resonance stabilization with that pi bond. So pretty much any charge I put on that allylic position is resonance stabilized. Okay. If we now shift to our benzylic position, it should look really, really familiar. What does the benzylic position kind of look like? It looks the same as an allylic position. Okay. So the benzylic position has similar chemistry as the allylic position. Okay. So where have we seen that chemistry before? We could go through and add a base. That base can potentially remove the hydrogen because we form a resonant stabilized carbocation. Okay. So that gives us some activity. We could also see it with a substitution. Okay, that bromine is now really willing to leave because it leaves behind a tertiary carbocation that water can then attack. That first reaction was what type of reaction? So here, let's actually go back one. What type of reaction is this? This is a massive hint. Guaranteed this is on your exam. Nope. SN1 and SN2 are going to be problematic. Those are mechanisms, not reactions. The substitution is your overall class. That's the reaction. Nope. It's an acid-base reaction. Focus on the only thing that happened. We exchanged a hydrogen. That's it. It's an acid-base reaction. Yeah, that was a lot of work for just acid-base. You're right. Why is that important to be able to look at? If you look at the reaction and know that's acid base, you can now start to predict something about what reagents might be provided. Maybe I don't give you the NaOH, but I give you those two pieces. What changed? I just removed a hydrogen. How do I remove a hydrogen? I need a base. So let's add a base. Oh, now I've got the reagent. Okay. Recognizing the patterns of your reactions is incredibly important. And I promise you, I will ask you what all five reactions are and ask you for examples. Okay? And that will be probably to the point where I will give you five points, but if you get them wrong, I will subtract points. Okay? Because it is incredibly important. You need to know when you look at a reaction to say, this is this type of reaction. Okay? So let's try that again. What are the five types of reactions? Acid base, good start. Elimination, substitution, addition, and radical. Radicals in its own separate category because they actually do substitution and uh, addition reactions. So I kind of just leave radicals as the stepchild. Okay. Sorry if you're a stepchild. My brother's a stepchild. He didn't <laughs> You need to be able to tell me what those reactions are and give me an example. Any example you want. Is that for this exam? For Coming this out? exam. Next Wednesday.
there are two implied hydrogens. There's not a lone pair. If there's a lone pair, it wouldn't be positively charged. So it's implied hydrogens. All right, you ready for the next one? What happened in this reaction? It is substitution. Acid base reactions are tricky. The only time you have an acid base reaction is that when that is the only thing that has happened. There is an exchange of a hydrogen between the water and the bromine to form HBr. Is that the only thing that happened? No. No. Okay. More importantly, this is organic chemistry. Where should we have our focus? What happened to the carbon structure? And what happened to the carbon structure? Lost a bromine, gained an OH. We did substitution. Okay, so this is a substitution reaction. Very fast reaction, okay, because we form a very stable carbocation because that benzylic position is resonant stabilized with the benzene ring, okay, just like the allylic position was. Oh, that one's boring. What's this one? Worries me too. It's substitution. Next question, and these are things that you need to be able to evaluate. You go through, you identify what reaction you are. What's the next question? Are there multiple mechanisms? What's the difference between the second reaction and the third reaction? I know, that goes all the way back to first semester. So we would look at the substitution pattern on our substrate to decide whether it's SN1 or SN2. What else could we look at? So with substitution and elimination, there are four things you are responsible for knowing. I love holding up fingers, apparently. At least there are multiple fingers, right? Not one. You've got the strength of your nucleophile, substrate. Cation, I typically classify in the substrate. So the next one I would argue is kind of a weird one. Leaving group. You need to have a good leaving group. And the last one, which you very rarely have to work with, the solvent. Yeah. Those four things you need to evaluate to decide do you have an SN1 or an SN2? When else do you have to evaluate those exact same four things? The E1 or the E2? Those of you struggling with homework 17, the very last question, big long one with all these stupid mechanistic steps. How a lot of people go through it. I can do it in three steps. No, you can't. What you did in three steps was an E2 elimination. It's asking you for an E1. How do you know that it wanted the E1 elimination? You go back and you evaluate those four things. Substrate, leaving group, strength of your base, and the solvent. Based on that information, the problem tells you it's E1. You didn't look to that information. Okay? And I know that is ridiculously challenging. You have to keep going back. In Gen Chem, when they talk, finished talking about kinetics, when did you see kinetics again? You didn't. It was nice. So you could deal with something in Gen Chem, worry about it for a week, and completely forget it. This is not general chemistry. You have to know it for the whole year. Yes, I know. As you continue to practice, it builds. And you get frustrated with me telling you the same thing. Bless you. Frustrated yet? Please don't hurt me. I'm just the messenger. Okay, so benzylic positions, very reactive. Okay. The new chemistry at the benzylic position, okay, uh, it happens to be particularly susceptible to oxidation, meaning if I have a really strong oxidizer, uh, chromic acid is a good one. You can see it as either H2CRO4 
or you may see it as the dichromate and sulfuric acid. Both of those are the equivalent things. Nobody seems to be consistent on how they present it. They kind of go back and forth between showing both of them. Okay? So you're responsible for knowing both of those as being the same thing. As long as you have a benzylic hydrogen, that reagent goes in and it destroys everything at that position and replaces it with oxygens. And I mean everything. So if we take a look at this starting material, do we have a benzylic hydrogen? Where's the benzylic position? First carbon from the ring. There's our benzylic position. How many bonds are shown? Two, which means two implied hydrogens. Do we have one benzylic hydrogen? Yes. Chromic acid comes through and says, I don't like any of that, and replaces all those bonds with oxygen bonds. So there were three bonds there, two to hydrogen, one to a carbon. And it went through and replaced that with bonds to oxygen. Where are those bonds? One, two, three are pi bonds. Okay. How does it do that? Please don't ask me. It just does. It just does does. <coughs> what happens to the other carbon chain? That's also a good question. I have yet to even seen that show up in the literature. So, right? just, is it so it just it? kicks it off, throws it somewhere to the curb. This is one of the reasons why organic is nice, because we don't worry about balancing. <laughs> so we just ignore that other piece and we focus on the benzylic pieces. Yeah, I'm not happy with it either, but I've been looking for it and I can't find something. You don't need any mechanism. All you need to know is, is there a benzylic hydrogen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Then when I add chromic acid, what happens? Delete it. everything and turn it into benzoic acid. Mm -hmm. Are you what else are strong oxidizers? Those, that's the one you're worried that's about. It. Yep. Are you being honest how many carbons we have after the Regardless of how many carbons we have afterwards, to a certain extent. So let's go through and, and do a couple examples here. What's the product we're concerned about now? What do we get? How do we change the product? Maybe we should wait till you're all looking. Okay, here we go. There's a methyl group in red. What's our product? Benzoic acid. What's our product? There is still one implied hydrogen. That one implied hydrogen allows chromic acid to say, F all of this, <laughs> and turn it into benzoic acid. Okay, so now I'm going to clean that all up. Yeah, it's one that I never remember either. So even... What's the product now? Is that carbon still there? Or does it take that carbon no reaction. The benzoic acid is not formed in this case because there's no benzylic hydrogen. Have the benzylic hydrogen, take it to the acid. No benzylic hydrogen, leave it alone. So it'll kick off both carbons even though the one carbon's hanging off to the side. It'll kick them all off. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Wicked reagent just kind of destroys everything. I, and I really wish I knew how it worked. I've come up with some weird guesses, but they are very weird. Okay? So, I know I tell you, you don't need to memorize. This is one. Memorize. I mean, there really isn't anything else I can tell you about it. That's what the reaction does. Okay? If you have that benzylic hydrogen, you get rid of it. What's the product? No reaction. Okay. There is no reaction. So how would we see this on a test? So let's see if I can come up with, well, NR would work potentially for if I asked you it in a short answer. But what if it doesn't show up in a short answer? If it shows up in multiple choice. So there's a couple ways to draw it out, undoubtedly. 
you will see this. Okay? Just to help out, a lot of people, and I didn't say this was the answer. I just said this was one of the answers you would see. It's one of your choices. A lot of people have been missing this. What is the Lewis structure for this? What I've been saying a lot of is this. No. No. Okay. It's it's right it's right above. It's the carboxylic acid. Okay. You need to know that abbreviation. Okay. One of the reasons why I think students often confuse it with that long string of lines is what if we went through and wrote. That's different, sort of. And now it's the peroxy acid. With that extra oxygen, we do have to string some of them. Avoid bonding oxygen to oxygen. Okay. So that was one of your answers. Okay. Uh, well, shoot. I can only think of two answers. And you see that as an answer. It's the starting material. And in this case, your answer is the starting, the starting material. Okay. The product of the reaction was that no reaction occurred. So what did you isolate as your product? The starting material. Okay. It's a very tricky way to ask the question. So be careful of those. Not necessarily going to say no reaction. Yes? Um, for the hydrochromic acid, your other one, it's the same. It's the same thing. Those reagents are equivalent. And they would have the same solvent? Same system. Okay. Yep. And yeah, you'll notice that there's even a third one there with water being added in there. All the same. What was the top product? If it doesn't, there's no reaction, so what was the So all I could think, multiple choice, you'll always have four answers. All I can think of right now to include would be two answers. So we'd have A, B, C. N, D, okay. A and D for sure would show up. What B and C are? Uh, I mean, I could start guessing at random things. And really what those guesses are are usually because someone saw a student write this as an answer. So they said, oh, someone's missing something, so let's drop in an OH. So there's one. It oxidized. Put in an OH. Okay, so they put in misleading things. So you need to be very careful with what you're answering. Okay? Awesome. We haven't even gotten to the fun stuff yet. Reduction of the aromatic moiety. Okay? I've had a couple questions on this. What is moiety? Fancy way of saying peace. Okay? That's it. So if we have a big structure, and within that big, large structure, we see an aromatic ring, we go, oh, it's got a, an aromatic moiety. Part of that structure is an aromatic ring. Peace doesn't sound scientific enough, so we came up with moiety. <laughs> sure. Let's go with that. I have no idea. Messenger. Messenger. <laughs> Messenger. All right. <laughs> <clears throat> Benzenes are ridiculously stable, so would we expect to be able to reduce them? Okay. Would we expect to be able to remove a double bond from the structure? Strong okay. Does that sound like an easy thing to do? What did we say about aromatic rings? Are they stable? They're very stable? They are very stable. What happens when we remove the double bond when we do an EAS reaction? The very next step, what happens? Puts it right back on. Okay. So removing a double bond from a ring is very, very rare. Right? It's not easy to do. We need special reagents to do it. But we can indeed do that. Indeed do it. Indeed do it. <laughs> Similar to an alkyne. Right? It's the same kind of idea. With the alkynes, we could add sodium metal in the presence of ammonia, and we end up with the trans double bond. Right? It's the only reagent with a reduction that we can actually generate a trans double bond. Because typically adding hydrogen across a pi bond Hydrogen is so small that they add on the same side. We get the cis product. Okay? When we use sodium metal in the presence of ammonia, the mechanism is slightly different. 
the difference in the mechanism allows for a free rotation. That free rotation is what gets us into the trans conformation because trans is more or less stable than the cis. More, because we've got our larger groups further away from each other. Okay, so something about how the sodium metal reacts allows for that rotation. Okay? Aromatics will do a sort of similar thing. So let's first take a look at the mechanism, because I don't think I gave you guys the mechanism first semester for the reduction of the alkyne. Okay. So it should be in the slides. It is. Uh, the image is not. This is, again, a covered-up image. So there's a white... Oh, it does? Okay, never mind. It's there. I would argue you're not really responsible for it either. Okay. What you're going to be responsible for knowing is that if you add sodium metal to an alkyne, what happens? Trans double bond. Okay. The reason we're now looking at the mechanism is looking at the pieces of it. You'll notice right in the middle, after that very first step, what we form is this species right here. Okay. That is a radical and an anion. That species is going to get mimicked in our aromatic ring. And that's going to determine the selectivity or the regiochemistry of our reduction, okay, which we'll look at in just a second here. So our overall mechanism, sodium dumps an electron in. In the process of dumping that electron in, we end up now with our radical and the anion. Questions about that mechanism? I'll give you a few seconds to look over it. The pi bond splits like a radical because we're doing a radical reaction. And then it just snags that electron from sodium. Yep. And then the sodium wanders off. Is that the sodium ion? Why would the sodium wander off? And it is absolutely true. What type of bond has formed between the carbon and the sodium? Sigma bond. Ish. Ish. Yeah. It's an ionic bond. What do ionic bonds do? Yeah. Dissociate into the ion. So whenever you see a metal drop onto a structure, it's really best to just pretend that the metal floats off on its own and the electrons stay behind, which will become more important the tail end of our second exam. Are oxidation and reduction reactions like part of the radical? Radical reactions can do oxidation and reduction. <laughs> yeah. Typically they are because oxidation and reduction is the transfer of electrons from one atom to another. Radicals are really the only ones that do that. Our substitution elimination reactions don't transfer electrons, typically. Now, I was just wondering on this one, are we saying that we started out with the sodium as being a radical, or are we making it into a radical? Does sodium start as a radical? How many electrons does sodium metal come in with? One electron. It is effectively a radical to begin with. Yes. Yes. So one of the pi bonds okay. gives up a single electron to form a bond with the sodium. The other electron goes to the other carbon. Okay. What makes this reaction special is that this intermediate, okay, our radical anion intermediate, those R groups try to get as far away from each other as possible. And because they start completely on opposite sides, the course of the reaction is just going to naturally flow to push them to opposite sides of the alkene. We don't actually have to worry about where specifically they are. And what makes them do radical? Is that the NH2? What makes the radical? Yeah. Is that the what is the electron configuration for sodium? Uh, just one. It has one electron. There's your radical. Sodium metal starts as a radical. When we go through and do it with an aromatic ring, we remove the double bond. But you'll notice we don't remove the double bond and leave the rest of the double bonds all in the same place. You notice that we get a rotation. Okay. And this is one of the effects. If we start with just a normal alkene, alkenes don't react with sodium metal. Okay. This is why the sodium reaction is nice with alkynes, because we stop at an alkene. With the aromatic ring, because it has that extra electron configuration with the other pi systems, is we get a shift of electrons around the structure, and we end up with this final product, where the double bonds 
are on opposite sides of the ring. Okay? This reaction, because it's goofy and weird, we might as well name it after the goofy and weird person that came up with it. Never met him. Personally, he's probably goofy. Birch reduction. Okay, so you'll hear it referred to as the Birch reduction. It is officially a reduction because we've added hydrogen across a double bond. That double bond just happened to move around a whole bunch on us, but we still added hydrogen. Okay. I haven't talked about the mechanism yet. That's the next slide. So what happens with our birch reduction? This should have been stepwise. Sorry. So same general idea. The sodium metal comes in with that free electron and gives up an electron to one of the pi bonds. Okay. The pi bond has two electrons in it. Okay. So it needs to somehow dump those electrons somewhere. You'll notice that we don't see just a nice, simple, one-step situation. We've got a crap ton of arrows. Why do we have that crap ton of arrows? We're trying to get the electrons as far away from each other as possible to help kind of mitigate and stabilize them as best we can. Okay? So the aromatic ring will undergo single electron resonance to form our intermediate. That intermediate should look really familiar because it's the same kind of thing that I circled before. It is a radical and an anion. Okay? The most reactive thing within that is then the negative charge. So the negative charge will go out and pick up a hydrogen from the solvent, ammonia. There's our first hydrogen added to the structure. Okay, so on our very first step, our radical sodium dumps an electron into the ring. The ring panics and tries to shuttle the electrons around to get the negative charge as far away from the radical. Okay, we're trying, because we have too many electrons, we need to get the electrons away from each other. Because what happens when we put electrons near each other? They repel. They repel. So our electrons naturally are going to spread as far away as they can. The farthest away they can get is that radical anion. At this point, we now have an extremely unstable structure, and we need to stabilize it. Okay. The best way to stabilize it is focus on the highest energy thing. When we talk about reactivity, what do we look for? Charge. charge. Where is their charge in the structure? The negative. So we need to stabilize the negative. How can we stabilize a negative? Positive. Something positive. Okay. Sodium doesn't form a permanent bond. We got that ionic bond, so that doesn't help. We need to find a positive anywhere else. The only anywhere else that's out there is the hydrogen from our solvent, ammonia. Okay. It picks up that hydrogen. We have now neutralized the negative charge. So part of our instability, or instability, is now fixed. Yes? It only picks up one hydrogen? It only picks up one hydrogen. It can't pick up another hydrogen because our hydrogen has is picked up using what type of arrow? A double-headed arrow. To do a double-headed arrow, how many electrons do I need? Why does the radical not do it? It doesn't have two electrons to pick up the H+. Plus. It can't do it. Okay. So we fix the negative charge. We still have the radical, so we need to fix the radical. Radical is unstable because it is unpaired. So what should we do? Pair it with another electron. What's the most available single electron source? Sodium. Sodium metal. It picks up another electron. Didn't I show that? Yeah, there it is. It picks up another electron in a single electron transfer radical reaction to again form our unstable anion. The anion panics and freaks out and says, I need to stabilize. I need something remotely positive. What is available that's positive? Another hydrogen found in the solvent, in the solvent again, and we end up with our final product. So why is it called reduction? It's a radical reduction, but it is still a reduction. 
Okay, we tend to focus more on the, the reduction aspect than the radical because is this mechanism, mechanism entirely a radical mechanism? There are two acid-base steps that are not radicals. So what is the final product? The final product is what's shown, is the upper right-hand corner. So at that time, we have no more radical? In the we have no more radical because it's been quenched. No. Okay, okay. yeah, just a second. The hydrogen's not the reactive species. The anion is the reactive carbon. species. Yeah. The negatively charged carbon is the reactive. So the what do we need to stabilize that negatively charged carbon? Positive. positive. Something positive. What's the so most positive just, thing in the solution? It just forms a bond with the positive. It's picking up a hydrogen from the solvent. That's the only source of positive in this entire solution. There's nothing else out there. Short of the sodium ion, but the sodium ion, that positive charge, ionic bond, can't stabilize it. Okay, now back to you. But might we lost the uh, iron that is? Yes, we did. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
aromatic ring with an electron withdrawing group, where would I expect my electron withdrawing group to show up in my product? So away, from away, from it. away from the double bonds. That's what I would expect. Why? Okay, our most reactive species in here was that negative charge, the anion. That's bad. We don't like anions. We need to stabilize that anion. So if we're concerned about now dropping in a substituent somewhere on the ring, okay, let's focus at that anion. How could I make that anion more stable? What would I want near it? Something positive. Which group gives you something positive? An electron withdrawing group or an electron donating group? An electron withdrawing group. Which means if I start my overall structure with some electron withdrawing group on it, my double bonds are going to react such that the negative charge is going to be dumped onto the electron withdrawing group's position. Wherever it is on the ring. But they won't leave and go to the electron withdrawing group? They'll switch the... The reaction starts dependent on how the electron withdrawing group dictates the electron chemistry goes. It's not going to cut you. We don't pick, take electrons and remove them from a structure and throw them somewhere else. It doesn't happen. Okay, they move slowly through it depending on how that electron withdrawing group affects that resonance. Okay. What happens if now I throw on an electron donating group? Okay, you'll notice in this case I did not put on an alcohol. Why would an alcohol be a problem? It has an acidic hydrogen, which would react very violently with the sodium metal, and that would be a big mess. So we want to avoid that issue. All right. Where would I expect that O-methyl to show up. Let's move to the very next step, our intermediate. Do I want the O-methyl on the negative charge position? No. 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 So let's not put it there. Where does it end up in the product? Off of one of our double bonds. Does it matter which double bond? No. No, because they all are going to generate the same product. Why is it not on the radical carbon? What does the oxygen donate? Uh, what's at the radical, or your radical carbon has what? Electrons. electrons. We want to get the electrons away from each other. Okay? So, take a look at these two options. Electron donating group, what do we expect for our product? So, we draw our product in here. It'll be on one. Our electron withdrawing group. It's going to be away from the double bonds. But is that an electron withdrawing group? That oxygen on the bottom? Yes. Why is it yes? Because it has Resonance, resonance withdraws electrons from the carbon. This carbon becomes positively charged. That is an electron withdrawing group. Ta-da, ta-da. Okay. Not reduced. It doesn't have hydrogen added to it. It's still the double bond. I know, deep breath. Do we need to put on our reagent as well? Um, don't worry about the alcohol, this guy. If you see the sodium and the NH3, that's what you should focus on. The rest of it is a solvent. Okay. We use it to dissolve it. That's about it. Okay. 